do I need an antivirus checker in Linux? Now, while it's true that Linux is a very small target in terms of operating systems, it doesn't mean there are no viruses. In fact, it's highly lucrative for a hacker to infect a Linux system because the traditional mentality of, you don't need an AV in Linux, will ensure any infection goes undiscovered. Now, I have been infected on Linux thanks to a common web exploit, which took advantage of poor coding in Adobe Flash. <laughs> Typical. I also expect the same thing happened to my old Android phone. Would an AV have helped in either instance? No. <laughs> For my Linux system, the virus was fresh out and wouldn't have been detected by an AV yet. And for my Android phone, the infection was buried within the OS and not app-based. Key difference there, the common exploits are app-based and is what most people think of. Mine was not. I've been working in the computer security industry for the past four years. I can't tell you the company I work for, but what I will say is you can't go and buy their products in a store. So I have no affiliation to any particular AV product. This means I can say they are all far from 100% effective. Not even 50% effective. Consider them more like 20% or lower. Now that may come as a shock, but anyone selling a product will insist you absolutely need it. So on that note, I am off to buy a Dragon Insurance and an extended warranty. So for business users, I would recommend that you use an antivirus because you have a responsibility for customer data and it's, and it's extremely damaging to a business's reputation to be reported in the news that they've had all their data stolen. You've probably got some industrial secrets that need protecting too. For home users, it's an optional thing. First, let's look at the possible methods of infection. There's drive-by downloads from an infected website, malicious spam emails, infected installation files, infected media, or a deliberate attack from a local user. Now, if you're the sort of user, or you're dealing with the sort of user who has no restraint and thinks, whoosh, I need, I want that, you should probably use an AV because it's better than nothing. But if you can minimise your attack vector, then you don't really need an AV. So how about preventing drive-by attacks? Well, firstly, what is a drive-by attack? So that's, you've gone on to a legitimate website that a hacker has got into and inserted a bit of code, which your browser just goes and blindly downloads because it should do, because it's on the page you're trying to download. <laughs> but yeah, it downloads this bit of code, that tells it to go and download a script from another website. And this script then tries and attempts attacks against software that you have installed on your machine. Now this could be sloppily coded software like Adobe Flash. And the end result is malicious program gets downloaded and installed on your machine. But that one is a surprisingly common yet fairly well unreported method of attack. So Adobe Flash and PDF Reader are the biggest targets. And from the amount of critical updates that I see every month, the problem is not going to improve. I recommend removing them entirely because no Adobe Flash means no method of malware to attack it. <laughs> and many websites have moved to HTML5, therefore negating the need for Flash. But if you run into websites that still need Flash, you could try spoofing the user agent to trick the website into thinking you're running a mobile device. I've done a tutorial video on how to trick the BBC News into thinking you're running an Android device, therefore it sends a HTML5 video to you. That same trick can be used on many other websites. But if that trick doesn't work and you still absolutely must have Flash, then you can use a browser add-on to block Flash and only enable it on a case-by-case -case basis. Keeping your browser and other software up to date will mitigate the risk of potential infection. You can also go further and block adverts with an ad blocker add-on uBlock is my current favourite. Using OpenDNS will also help block malicious websites. But the ultimate, the ultimate trick is to do a third party or cross site blocking, which will totally prevent your browser from downloading malicious code from an attacker's website, therefore blocking any infection. Malicious spam emails. There's been a big return to the old malicious macro-based attachments that we first saw, what, 20, 30 years ago? So first off, consider the sender. Are you really expecting an invoice, unpaid bill, or hacked account? 
If an email comes with special instructions on how to open a document, or if it comes with a password, you should just delete it. Stop and think, why should I need to take special steps to view unsolicited content? The simple answer is, you shouldn't. Now the common piece of malware that I know of lately with those malicious emails is CryptoLocker, or variants of CryptoLocker, so that's quite a nasty thing to get on your computer. Infected installation files. Now the regular advice I see is only download from trusted websites. How do you know what a trusted site is? Well, the best advice I can give is stick to the operating system repositories as much as you can. Now, downloading free open source software or games from the particular project's website could also be considered as safe. But downloading a file that someone says will give you pay for content for free, like a game or porn, should really be avoided. Executables from torrent or Usenet sites should also be considered as extremely risky. Basically, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably contains a load of malware. Infected media. This sounds so simple, but don't just go and plug in a USB stick that you found laying on the ground. You have no idea what it contains. Just consider, why was it left on the ground? Because someone accidentally dropped it? or because they were trying to infect other people's or businesses' computers. Hmm. Audio CDs can also be risky too. I'm thinking back to the days when Sony put a root kit on their audio CDs. And lastly, deliberate attacks from a local user. Now, can you really trust your family or friends? Who knows? I don't know. But if you feel this is a potential risk, then the best thing to do is use a secure password. Now don't just use something that they're going to know, like your date of birth, the street you grew up on, your mother's maiden name, those are things they're all going to know. So you've got to try and think outside the box a bit and think, what won't they know? And you could go for a, a string of words. The correct horse battery staple could be a good one. And the other thing you can do is just try and lock down the access on their accounts as much as you can, really. Now, I'm sure that's a pretty cruel thing to do, but if you don't need to give your spouse or children administrator rights, then don't. Just minimise it as much as you can. That particular tutorial is outside the scope of this video, but I'm sure there are other tutorials around on the internet that can show you that. So in conclusion, if you can practice self-control and minimise your potential attack vector, by keeping applications up to date and removing dangerous applications like Adobe Flash, then there is no reason to use an antivirus. But if you're unable to contain the risk, then use an AV. But remember, they are far from 100% effective.